Welcome back to Beyond the Uniform. I'm Justin Asiri, and my goal is to help military veterans and their families succeed in their civilian careers. Today's episode number 310 with Aaron Barnes. So the good thing about the keto diet, I don't know if most people know, it started back in 1920, and it was used for uh, people with epilepsy, and it was used to help them control seizures, and it was very effective. But at some point, somebody came along and said, hey, let's give them some of this some medicine. We got some real medicine, this powder, this, these pills. And so we've gotten off track. And for the most part, a lot of our illnesses that we feel are from the food that we put in our mouth. So um, I would challenge you to, um, on a daily basis, you know, kind of check what you're putting in your mouth. And even if you don't do it every day, maybe challenge yourself five days out of the week. And then you have those two days, the weekend or whenever, when you just kind of go all out on the eating. But try to lean a little bit more towards eating healthy. You're going to feel better and you're going to live a, a healthier life. Today's episode is about Aaron, who started a company called Keto Butter. Uh, it is a primarily entrepreneurial episode, but one of the things I would love for you to pay attention to in this episode is I really admire Aaron's constant sense of learning through audiobooks, through YouTube videos, through peer groups. Um, I think that can be applied to any career path, as well as how he embraces, uh, I would call it wise experimentation, and that is trying out different things, learning, and not necessarily just beating his head against the wall and trying to make things work, but figuring out where there's wind in his sail, figuring out what the smart move is. And I love the discussion we had in this about developing one's discernment, about developing one's intuition in terms of the contrast between listening to customers and also forming your own vision. And I think that's relevant to pretty much any career path. As always, at beyondtheuniform.org, you'll find show notes for this episode, thanks to Kathleen Dillon, which has a text, text transcript of the entire episode, as well as links to everything we discuss. You'll also find a link to, link to check out Kita Butta and support a fellow veteran uh, paving his own way, building a company that's very much in alignment with his personal values. You'll also find over 300 episodes just like this one. So with that, let's dive in to my conversation with Aaron. Joining me today in Vancouver, Washington, sometimes in Portland, Oregon, we're very frequently there. My guest is Aaron Barnes. Aaron, welcome to be on the uniform. Hey, glad to be here. Glad to be here, Jess. So the um, quick background for listeners is that Aaron is the chief grinder at Keto Butter, <laughs> Butter uh, which isn't about being part of a diet craze or just selling a regular almond butter. It's a fun, delicious, and healthy way of living. He served in the Army as a telecommunication system oper operator for over nine years and also currently serves as the city leader, leader for Bunker Labs in Portland, Oregon. Um, so, Aaron, maybe to start things off, let's actually just start set the stage for people. Um, for the few listeners who do not have Tim Ferriss tattooed on their right bicep, <laughs> what is keto? <laughs> so keto is, I mean, it's a, uh, truly it's a lifestyle. And I guess a lot of people like to say it was spun off the old Atkins diet. Mm -hmm. So it's basically a, a diet of you eating a lot of high fats, good quality fats. Um, you get some proteins in there and some vegetables. Um, very so, super low carb, no carbs, almost no carbs. I mean, it's, it's like a step beyond paleo, right? Yes, yeah. yes, it's, it's paleo's it's like, cousin, first cousin. It's, okay, it's like the Navy SEALs of diets. It's, it is, right. or lifestyles, it is, it is very, um, but, but the thought is that you burn, you, you get your body to ketosis so it burns more fat more frequently. Fat. Right, right. So you're using fat as fuel as opposed to carbs. Okay. And I also wanted to ask, because I'm I, I, pretty sure you actually have a pretty compelling story. I mean, this wasn't you were trying to get ripped to go to the beach to take your shirt off. Like, what, what was it that led you to keto? So it was, uh, it was candida. Candida is an overgrowth of the bad bacteria in the gut. It turns into a fungus. Um, very difficult to reduce back to his natural state. So it took me like three weeks to self-diagnose that because my VA doctor told me I did not have candida mm. without doing any type of tests on me whatsoever. No spit tests, no uh, urine tests, no stool, nothing. She did nothing. She walked into her office, said a couple of things to me, told me I didn't have it, and then I, I just left. I haven't seen her since. That was three years ago. How did you... 
I, I'll, I have a personal story here, but let me, let me get into like, so how did you, first props to you, most people I think would take that at face value, great check, I don't have this, let's move on. But you knew, you knew something wasn't right. What, what were you experiencing and also where did you go from there? Like how did you find answers? So, so initially uh, I found out whenever I would eat sugar, between my latter two toes on my left foot, I would have this like a tingling sensation started up. And then there was times as, as months progressed, it got worse. And if I ate like a lot of sugar, it would kind of like start to burn. And I was thinking, I barely drink alcohol. I can't have gout, mm. right? And so I put that in first and I'm reading about gout and I'm saying, oh, well, that doesn't make much sense. Then I'm getting this burning in my gut. Uh, that along with some, uh, severe night sweats. I found that I was severely depleted in vitamin D. So I had like four or five symptoms and I kept plugging those in at different times and all together. And over a three week time period, yes, it basically said I had candida. So then I started reading about candida diet. So the deal with candida is it's fed by sugar and bad carbs. And so what is keto? Keto is anti-sugar. So I'm on the fats at this point. And that's how I basically got into this whole thing and how Originally, life butter, keto butter, got started. How? Um, what? When you when you found this, so you're looking for this, this all this time. When you found this kind of um, keto diet, like, what was the impact for you? Like, did you notice a change right away? Uh, yes, right away. And so, a lot of people talk about the keto flu. I don't think I really went through the keto flu because I had been juicing so much mm -hmm. prior to that. Right. Mm -hmm. So my system was fairly clean uh, until I hit those bumps. But coming into that, um, yeah, I can't just really say that I had keto flu, but your body does make adjustments, whether you're going from eating healthy to bad or bad to good. And I was already in such a nasty state already of having pain and, and, and aches that um, I don't think I would have been able to tell mm. um, if I was having keto flu or not. Mm. What, what is keto flu? So it's... I mean, I guess you feel some kind of like flu symptoms, but with your body getting used to burning ketones, mm. the fats, instead of the carbs. Because, I mean, since we've been kids, all of us, for the most part, we've been burning carbs. Mm -hmm. right? that's, our, that's what our body's used to. And when we're used to something, making that transition like that, our body usually goes through this, um, you know, like if you're trying to starve out sugar or stop smoking or get off drugs body goes into this natural state like hey i want what i want you're not giving it to me um it gets in a panic you mm -hmm. know for x amount of time now i don't know how long it normally lasts for people but uh yeah so you do go through some like withdrawal symptoms basically because body wants carbs and you're feeding it fat mm. so what led you then to start your your company so i'm back at my like natural weight about 155 now and this is the weight i was at when I initially found out I had candida. So I dropped about 14 pounds in about five weeks because no sugar, mm. no white flour, right? And so I needed to put some, I wanted to put some weight back on, good protein. So I was eating a lot of like walnuts, mm. almonds, and I was literally tired. And I tell people this and they laugh at me, of course, um, tired of just eating dry nuts. You know, you're eating like about a handful and they're dry. And so I said, hey, I could probably just take some almond butter and I could mix a bunch of these superfoods into it. So the whole point was to get more, more nutrition per bite, mm -hmm. right? Kind of like to make a smoothie. So we take the, we put all these ingredients in there. So I basically did kind of the same thing with almond butter. Mm -hmm. And so I would sit, I would go to Costco, I would get their, I think it's like a 22 ounce almond butter little tub. I would come home, take a butter knife, I would stir it up, get the oils all over it. And then I would scoop some out, dump a bunch of these superfoods and uh, sea salt. And I was using stevia at the time because I couldn't have sugar. <laughs> and I start to churn this until it was nice and mixed. And then I would just go sit on the couch because I had a lot of brain fog at that time too. And I can tell you this, I can be very honest. You know, my dad um, was a taskmaster and disciplined me coming up. And so I can, I can tell you, I've never had brain fog. People talk, oh, I have brain fog. And I, and I just didn't understand it. I can tell you, I know what it is now. I know what it is now. After going through um, what I went through, it's literally like going out to your car and say you just came from the gas station and your tank is half full. And then you walked out to your driveway and put and filled, and filled this, the rest of the way with water. 
So mm. you let them, you go crank it up after it runs for a couple of minutes, that water's gonna get in the in the line and it's gonna start popping and shut off and stutter and sputter. And that's the way I was at that time. Because my chemistry, your body chemistry is off. Mm. Um where where do you get the discipline to take I mean, this is a very, it, it, like you said, it's a lifestyle. I, I, so I know, um, let, me, let me back up. My wife is, is great. She's very aware of her body. When we were, you know, early in our relationship, she's like, I think you've got a problem with dairy and I think you've got a problem with wheat. And I'm like, no way, whatever. And meanwhile, like, you know, my stomach's always crazy. So right. I've like slowly developed more of a connection with my body and more of a sense when something's off. And I, I, you know, I eat pretty well gluten-free. I can struggle to try and get to paleo. And keto, to me, seems like running a double Ironman triathlon. It seems very hard. Where, where did you get the discipline to, to even live like this? So, well, you know, like I said, my dad. So it started with him, right? So, like, when I joined the military, it wasn't a matter of me getting discipline. I just picked up becoming detail-oriented when I joined the Army. He had instilled all of that at the house. Mm -hmm. Right. Because he was an entrepreneur, had his own businesses. I used to work with him for him, however you want to say it. So that's where it starts primarily. And then, you know, for me, I think about, you know, the movie Shawshank Redemption, right, where he said, get busy living or get busy dying. And I just come to the conclusion, you know, we're killing ourselves, some of us with food. It's just this autoimmune disease, type two diabetes, heart disease. And then, of course, uh, my ethnicity, I'm more prone to uh, like heart disease. Right. And like type two diabetes. So uh, I have kids, I have a wife now, and, you know, I want to be around. So those are the things that I use to, to motivate me to, to do what I need to do. Mm -hmm. Now, within uh, keto, I guess you can get down to like uh, 20 net carbs, right, is where a lot of people will cap. But I've seen you can go up to 50. So I'm up there on the higher end of the range. And I will be honest and tell you this, too. After I went on the keto diet strictly, not even really knowing what it was at the time, mm -hmm. but I just got into it and then started to learn as I went along. Now, my whole objective of me getting better was I could go right back and eat the cookies and sugar that got me there in the first place. And I'm, just, I'm telling you. And what happened is after I cleared myself up. So then you have to start testing, right? So you start testing foods. Because during that time, I couldn't have wheat. Mm -hmm. Wheat would set my hands on fire. My hands were like burning. I didn't know what was going on. Um, I couldn't have dairy at the time. I can have those things now, of course, in moderation. And you start testing foods to see if you, oh, I can have this. Uh, oh, I can have that. And then a couple of days, you'll try something else. And so I ate something sweet. And then I could feel the little tingle again. Like, oh, no, no sugar. Yeah, I have to back, back off. And so throughout that whole span i'm just still trying to get back to to where i was and then i did start to slightly feel the tingling again at some point maybe a year later in some of the foods i was eating and found out hey you gotta back off this buddy because at the same time i still didn't want this slower grind of deterioration to be going on right yeah yep. we're aging, but we're aging by the second right yeah if we can slow that down you know we get to feel more youthful and, and look yep. better and feel better so I love, I love how you're using your family as leverage though. You're using that as like, I'm not, I, I think that we get more juice for our motivation when we're not doing it for ourselves, but for something else. And so when you're doing that to like be there for your wife and kids, I think that gives, it gives your motivation a boost. It seems like. Yeah, it does. And because I always put myself, you know, I always try to put myself in other people's shoes mm. and I really do. Now, sometimes we have to step out of them real quick. Yeah. Right. But you know, if my, if one of my parents was sick, I would really appreciate it if they would make the changes they would need to, to be healthier and to be here longer. Yeah. Because at the same time of being here longer, I don't want to be here and be sick and be a burden on my kids either. Because mm -hmm. that, that, that does not serve them um, in, in any positive degree at all. So, so, so take us back. So you're, you're, in, you're going to Costco, you're in your kitchen, you're grinding stuff up, you're sitting on your couch, you're trying this. Um, how does the business evolve or when does this become like, does this start as something you're just doing for yourself or do you have this sense of like, Hey, others would benefit from this. So I was doing it for myself, but what happened uh, three, exactly three years prior to that. So I started a little juice business. And so I had, you know, in the military, they diagnosed me with IBS. And mm -hmm. so uh, now, so the first time that was just an experiment. So I 
Google search home remedy for IBS. I started reading these links and one said juicing daily would help. So I started juicing and about two months in, I was feeling great, wasn't having any stomach issues. So I say, hey, I'm gonna start this little business. So I did and I ran that for three years. And then that's when the sugar hit me. So that first one with the juice, that was just experimenting saying, hey, let me try this because I think it'll make me better. It will help me and it did. Now, with the candida thing, it was much more difficult, but at the same time, I knew I was able to get past the IBS at that point. So I said, I did this once, I can do it again, right? That's great. And, and so from that point, that, but it was a struggle because now I'm dealing with brain fog, which I didn't deal with before. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I'm eating this stuff daily, right? Some days I would eat like 16 ounces. So some days I was probably consuming about 5,500 calories. Here's the thing though, no, because my gut flora was off so bad. I mean, I was, like I said, I was constantly just losing weight. And I went down to lower than my high school weight, which was my, lo my lowest high school weight was like 138. I dropped down to 136 Wow. from 152 and I did it pretty fast. And so the nutrition and getting all this floor, good gut flora and probiotics in my body basically slowed down the weight loss process. And then at one point I just stopped there at 136, I plateaued, which was good. And so then I slowly started to gain weight again, very slowly. It was, yeah, it was, it was, it was kind of wild. How long did that take? I mean, how long do you think it took between starting and that dip and then back up to what you felt like was a, a more natural weight? So let's see, March, I want to say in, in March was when I really started to, to make changes. April, May was when I hit um, that low point and I was at uh, 136. It was mm -hmm. in May. And then I slowly started. So that was May, June, July, August. I would say it was, and I stayed at 136 probably for about, ooh, about a month. And again, I'm consuming all these calories, trying to, you know. Uh, so from May, I think it was about four months before I put on about four pounds. Wow. Oh, so, so that goes to the very point of, you know, you say, oh, I'm eating all this nutritious food. Well, if your digestive tract is dirty and your intestinal wall, so they're not going to absorb the nutrition from those healthy foods that you're starting to eat. So that's what I tell people a lot of times. Yes, your doctor suggested you eat healthy. However, I suggest you get the gunk out because think of any type of plumbing, right? Even water, you know, just water going down the line, you're going to get calcification right around it. So you have to flush that stuff out and get it out so that when you start eating this new, fresh, healthy way, um, your body can absorb that nutrition and you can get it and use it. So, so I'm so fascinated by how someone starts a food products company. Actually, let me, let me set the stage for listeners. So tell us, tell us what your company does now. Like, like talk about your products, talk about like kind of where you're at as a business. And then we're going to kind of rewind the clock and get back to how you got here. Woo, here you go in case you got so part of it i used to be in a jar and the original was called so let's, let's like you said right now so right now it's called keto butter it didn't really start with that name um so and we're looking at the convenience of people being on the go that's part of uh i believe the problem with food we don't have enough good tasting we have to start there nutritious foods that we can grab and go with in a lot of cases and so these right here can literally be served as a meal replacement. So we have MCT oil in here. MCT oil comes from, it is a derivative of coconut oil, which actually um, our body ingests quite quickly and can use, be used as energy and it's good fats for the brain. And so I took the coconut sugar out as monk fruit sweetener. So you get some slight sweetening with no carbs and no calories. So um, these right here are great for taking on plane, nice snack to grab at the coffee shop, take with you to work, you have it in, in your purse, uh, or in your glove compartment in the car when you're in traffic and you say, hey, it's going to be another hour before I get home. Nice, healthy snack in between um, consuming this and dinner before you get home and finish cooking. And, and for listeners, it's, it's worth going to the website. The packaging is beautiful. I'm a big fan of, uh, of branding. You've done an exceptional job. What, what he's holding up here in the video, it's um, one of them looks like a pouch, like if you have kids and you give them one of those... Um, uh, little pouches of, of, of ground up food. It has a little twist off top so you can ingest it on the go. And then one of them is kind of like a metallic packaging that looks like, um, I don't know, like a little um, plain, a little bit larger than plain card size packet where you can just rip off the top. And, and, and I'm guessing, do you, do you pour that into, or you, it's more of like a cream that you apply to something? 
Yeah, so it's because um, it has a superfoods blended into it, the, the other seeds. So it's a little, so it has uh, some texture to it. So a lot of times I eat it by itself, but of course it goes great on a banana, apple, parfait. You can put it in dates. Um, I mean, there's a lot of different applications for it. How do you, like, where are you, are you packaging this and putting it in there? Like, how did you find even people to put it in these packages? You kind of, I'm getting the sense that you experiment, you kind of find the thing that tastes right. Like, how does it get to the point where you're actually selling this online? So, <laughs> yeah, so the packaging, I, it's, it's funny because when I first got started, I kind of wanted to start here, but I didn't. It was more convenient and easier for me to start with jars. Then I had to do a, you know, massive internet uh, research to find these. Because what happens is, too, you get out here in some of these industries and you see somebody else doing something and you may ask them and you look like, oh, that's some competition coming. I'm not sharing the information. So a lot of digging to actually figure out the packaging. Um, yeah, I actually, I still, I'm still filling these myself. So at some point here in the very near future, actually, I'm starting to call on some co-packers now so we can start the conversation. So when I'm ready to take them on, I can kind of, you know, work myself and maybe a couple of other people in the commercial kitchen until I feel like I'm about to pass out, just drop dead. And then, hey, take the, take the baton, take the baton, it's yours, right? And so um, that's kind of where I'm at right now, which is really good. And I'm looking to, I'm kind of going off the beaten path from where you would traditionally go see this. You would traditionally go to a health food store. So yesterday I just got into one of the local Hilton hotels. And so I want, I want to be off the beaten path. I want you to find me where you don't think you're going to find me. That's great. And I, I want to point two things out for listeners who are aspiring entrepreneurs. One, I think that we kind of uh, maybe glamorize what we think of for entrepreneurship. And my experience and most of the people I've interviewed on the show are, are just like Aaron, where you're doing everything. He's putting this together, he's packaging, and he's almost to the point where he can have someone else do that. But you're so responsible for so many different aspects, which is, I'm, I'm imagining, extremely time at intensive. Yeah. And the, the second piece is... Um, I love, man, I, I actually, I had a really good second point and I'm blanking on it now. <laughs> Maybe we'll come, back. we'll come back to it. It was so good. You have to trust me. It was a great point, but I'm totally blanking on it, but, but keep going. But entrepreneurship, so I, I want to show your listeners something that they're going to, this clip be in there. So, you know, we talk about, so something else that's very important in entrepreneurship, I believe there's like three, four good points. So one is uh, you know, finding a mentor. Mm. If you, well, mentors, plural, because you don't want to get one person and, and start killing them with questions, right? Because you're going to have questions and that's fantastic. But you want to get yourself three or four uh, good mentors, one specifically in your space if you can, um, because they're going to be very invaluable. And the second part to that, I would say you're going to, because you want to Im impress them somewhat. So by studying, so this is audible. Right. I'm sure you've heard about it. So I got tons of books in here. I have tons of books in here. Right. And so what this, you know, entrepreneurs who've done things that you haven't done. Right. It's a recipe. It's all it is. They're going to tell you what they failed at, how they failed, how they were successful. So you keep listening to enough of these stories and you listen to enough of these books and podcasts. And then you'll get about 80 percent that you're just going to have within you that you're going to constantly keep hearing. Then it'll be the other 20 and 10 percent that you'll gain from these new entrepreneurs that you start listening to and you just take what they've done and some of it you can replicate, which is the same thing your mentor is going to be able to do, but they'll be able to do it in real time now based on this social media world and stuff that we're in with the internet as opposed to like Napoleon Hill. Yep. I love it. And uh, for listeners there, we do have with Audible, you can get a free audio book. There's a promo code in the show notes for this episode. While we're on that topic, anything stand out of like a, a book that you would recommend or a couple books you'd recommend to listeners? So I would, uh, one, uh, Ryan Holiday, Perennial Seller. I love that book. I love it, love it, love it to death. Uh, let me look here. Uh, but, 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 I mean, because I've been through so many of them. I've been through so many of them. Yeah, but the Perennial Seller, by Ryan Holiday, and I, I love Ryan Holiday. He has another one too. It's no, uh, well, you know what? I would suggest uh, Content Inc. Who was that? Um, uh, Joe Paluzzi. Content Inc. So it talks a lot about, of course, social media and putting out content. 
And basically, I believe what happened to him, he was going to start a company and the guy who was going to be coming up with the or helping him with the service or the product said it was going to be nine months before they would be able to go to market. So he basically went out and started creating community with content. So when his product was ready, he had super fans there waiting to buy from him, regardless of what it was that he had to offer. That's great. And I'll have links in those to those, both those books in the show notes. Um, let's, let's rewind a little bit further now that listeners kind of have a sense of what you're doing now. Um, you, I kind of glossed over your background and you, you know, you came from the army. You had a, it seems like a pretty technical career path. I, I'm curious about two things that I'd like to dive into. One is um, how you feel like that has helped you in what you're doing or has it helped you? And then second, how were you able to make the shift from what seems like a very hard technical skill into more consumer packaged goods where it doesn't seem like there's a lot of overlap? Uh, it's not. So yes, I was, I was in telecommunication. So my, my thinking when I joined the army, I'll go back that far and I'll jump up to where I got out, where I exited. So my thinking when I went into the military, was I wanted to gain a skill that I could use when I exited the military. And I have to say, somehow, um, he blessed me, I guess, because I was right on, right? And so when I got out, the, the telecom uh, industry was hot and was booming. And so it only took me like a couple of months to land a great job here in Vancouver. And so I went into that position. The company was about 10 years old. So I went in and I was a circuit activation technician. And it was interesting, and so I get there, and I'm starting to get trained up on their equipment. Literally, a month and a half in, I get tossed into this, uh, this group. There was a company called Covad at the time, and they were DSL provider. And so we were providing their pipes for them, DS3s, DS1s, for all their DS0 56K lines at the time. And so, yeah, I get thrown into this little group, and like I said, I didn't get to learn I didn't get to learn all of the kind of backdrop of the circuitry that I was installing. So literally I was just jumping in, having to connect, do cross connects in the, in the equipment software and test. And so that's all I was doing. And uh, I kind of got thrown to the wolves a little bit. We, we, we would be in some of these meetings, conferences on the phone, and these guys were not uh, nice. They were not nice at all. It was a lot of words being said that you don't want to sit in front of your parents, especially not your mom and repeat. And it, it kind of shook me a little bit, but it, it required me um, to get in there and really learn fast, right? I had to learn fast. And so that was, was one instance when I was there at that company. I stayed there for 14 months. Um, then I went to a startup called New Edge here locally. It was 11 months old when I got there. Now, I will tell you, I almost wanted to cry um, a couple of months after being there because here's the thing, with it being startup, they didn't have SOP. They didn't have standard operating procedures already. And I was hurting. I was hurting. So people are just doing things, you know, shooting from the hip off the fly. I'm scared not knowing what to do sometimes because a month after me being there, I got put on grave shift. And uh, I was Friday, Saturday, Sunday, Monday. And on Saturday and Sunday nights, I was there by myself. So something, red would, go, something would pop up red on the map. You know, I call a technician and still wasn't sure about some of the equipment. It was, it was, it was kind of crazy. So taking those things and transitioning to entrepreneurship. So one, um, being a technician with all of this, um, you know, social media stuff, and internet stuff that we have interacting with our businesses today made it a lot easier for me. The second part to that being thrown into that group like that right off the bat and not fully being trained and then um, being put on shift over at this other company when it's still new and not having a lot of SOP stuff, uh, same thing. So. That's entrepreneurship. That's entrepreneurship. So yeah, thrown in. And so along with that, once I decided to kind of do this thing too, again, I went to the recipes. And so for the listeners as well, there still are quite a few full audio book, business books on YouTube. You can search YouTube and find a lot of good information there. There's a lot of books still out there. That's I, awesome. Do you, it, I, I think of the portion of our listeners who are still on active duty and as I know I know like hindsight's 2020 but as you look right. back what do you how how would you advise them about if they want to start a company 
doing it right out of the military versus working even in an unrelated industry to get some sort of experience. Do you have any thoughts on kind of the, the trade-offs there? So I can tell you, so for me, right? So when I got, I was just hit me real quick. And then, so when I was, when I was getting out, um, let's see, about six months before I got out, I ran to like Office Max and got me a computer and I brushed up on my typing and I started job searching. So I was, I had interviews um, at Fort Bragg like uh, two, three weeks before I left the post. And when I got out here, I had an interview at Nike the day after I got out here, um, which was Thanksgiving. So we were out here Thanksgiving Eve, Thanksgiving, I was out at Nike on the interview. So uh, preparation, preparation. So I would start preparing. Of course, the internet's not what it was then. It's huge now. So um, of course, jump on the internet, start searching, especially if you want to stay in your industry. Well, outside the industry as well, but just prep as much as you can. Figure out where you're going, whatever state and city, and just start doing your homework. That being said, um, there's organizations now that I didn't have access to. We didn't have back then. Um, IBMF, Institutes of Veterans and Military Families, PBC, which is Patriot Boot Camp, and then uh, Bunker Labs, um, which I am currently a city leader now. We haven't kicked off our chapter, but um, go online, look these organizations up. They have resources. They have resources. They're here to help. I mean, that's why they exist. They exist to help those. And even if you don't actually want to be an entrepreneur getting out, if you say, hey, you know, I've been hearing a lot of buzz about Amazon. I'm going to be in the area where they're at or USAA. Any of these big organizations, a lot of them have relationships and they have their own division within the company uh, for hiring veterans. So I would just jump on top of that. If you did, like, again, find the company, say it's uh, salesforce.com, go to their website. I would start poking around, making some phone calls. You can call, like I said, find the local like bunker, bunker labs in your area, contact them. Usually if they're in that area already, they're going to have a relationship with them and they can put you in contact with the individual. That's awesome. And for listeners in the show notes, I, I've done interviews, uh, four interviews with IVMF, two with Bunker Labs, including Todd Connor, uh, uh, Todd Connor, their founder, and uh, Patriot Bootcamp as well. So if you're interested in those organizations, all three of them are exceptional. Uh, there'll be a link in the show notes for this episode where you can go listen to those interviews and learn more. And I agree, those are great resources to, to learn about it. But But back to that point, like, do you think it was necessary to have you know to have the work experience that you did before before you started the first of your two companies the work experience being um that i was in telecom or yeah yeah yep yeah it, it, yes it helped it helped so i can tell you so when i was uh, my, my first little business a little juice business i remember talking to one of the so I used to do farmer's markets when I was first getting started because you find out where you got to get to people. And that was a great place to start. And I can remember one of the managers telling me that, you know, everybody here isn't, you know, quite tech savvy. And so they wasn't up on square and being able to take mobile payments and things of that nature. So it's just, um, yeah. And, and that's when, you know, telecommunications was kind of really starting to blow up around that time when I went in. Because when I first went in, we had the mag tape reels, like you, like you see on James Bond, old James Bond movies. <laughs> and we had the man with the degaws and right on. And so now, and then, so when I, by the time I got out, um, we were on Cisco, we had Cisco routers. Did, um, did you, when you started the juice company, was that, were you kind of doing it on the side or did you kind of quit and do that full time? Like, how did you make that jump? Okay, so that transition, so initially it was on the side. Um, and so I was, uh, like I said, I was a network technician at the time, um, working 410s on swing shift. And I said, hey, I got the idea. And I said, hey, I can't just leave here. I can't run a brick and mortar. How do I want to do this thing? Um, let's see. So I'm right next door to the food cart capital, right next door to Portland. So I said, hey, I'll do it. I'll do a juice cart. And so I went and bought a little Ford Ranger. I went and bought a trailer. They shipped it off and had it retrofitted. Um, I took them both went to this design company, they designed uh, the graphics of the website and I went and had them both wrapped. I went out and started doing some farmer's markets and some um, events. And like with the farmer's market, so I will say this too. So when you guys and gals get out there, you're gonna have to kind of be paying attention to what you're doing. So I would suggest to somebody, farmer's market is a great place to start, but not stay. 
And so being at the market, I'm sitting here selling like $5, $6 juice, raw juice. And then there's kind of like a little snow coney thing, you know, a couple of booths down and they got a line like 20 feet long because that price point is like a buck 50, you know, or $2 and it is hot outside. But so I just learned that there's a different demographic. So I was serving a premium product. So there's certain people who want this, which is not the masses. And so I stopped doing the market and started making the juice in the cart and putting it in bottles and doing delivery. So I love what you had said earlier. I'm remembering the embarrassing point where I forgot what I was going to say, and now it might not live up to hype. But um, what you said earlier, and it kind of fits in with this, is you, you talked about going to where no one else is. And um, what I love about that is I love, like, I, you've got your antenna out, and you're experimenting, and you're doing little tests to see what works. And I, I know there's this part of me, I think it comes from the military, where I'll, like, kind of put my head down and break through a wall when the smart thing to do would be actually to put my head up and say, like you just said, hey, maybe farmer's markets aren't the right spot for me. So what I love about this is this experimental nature where you try something, you make an intelligent observation, and you adapt and overcome. And I also love your willingness. It's, it's a great business strategy to say, hey, people who are selling this type of products go to, I'm guessing, Whole Foods. So where else could I go, right? I could go to Whole Foods and try and compete with these established brands, or I could find a similar audience who wants this product, but they may not be bombarded. Maybe I go to delivery, or maybe I go to CrossFit gyms and try to do a partnership there. Like, I love your experimental nature, which is, is really uh, impressive. Well, thank you. Thank you. It's, again, it's, there's a couple of things. So I want to point this out too to the listeners. There's a couple of things. Uh, Brian Tracy, um, he's been in this entrepreneur game for a long time. And he, one of the things that he said is that um, they asked this guy, this guy had 3,000 points on uh, business and entrepreneurship. And he said, if he had to pick the one, the one thing, what would it be? And the guy said discipline. All right. So I, I would agree with that. That definitely has to, it has to be there. The second thing is that I would really point out as along with discipline, you know, again, paying attention to the kind of the terrain of, of where you're at. And when you do start out like the farmer's market, great place to start, not a great place to stay. And a lot of people will just try and tell you about your business and, oh, you should do this. And you're going to have to really just start to shut. You're going to have to shut a lot of people out. You're going to have to let them get it out and uh, give them a head nod and, and, and do what you may feel at this point. Why? Because you've been studying other entrepreneurs, you've been listening to their books and you've been following on, 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 excuse me, following them online, listening to podcasts. And so you're starting to feed yourself the good stuff and you'll start to find out that when you first get in, there's, there's quite a few, there's a lot, of, a lot of yeses because you're gonna gain knowledge and experience being out there early in the beginning. And then there's gonna come a point where you have to flip the switch and start telling people no quite often because then you'll start to eat up too much of your time. I love, I love this tightrope walk that you're describing where on the one hand, you're super receptive and experimental and getting feedback. You're de dealing directly with customers. You're listening and adapting and you're counterbalancing that with your passion and beliefs and ideals and what you believe the business needs. And what I love about that is it sounds like you use these audiobooks and books to kind of nourish that side of you, to give you the wisdom to know between the two. And I'm just thinking of entrepreneurial mistakes I made where I just listened to customers. They told me, you know, I, I love that quote um, uh, that Ford said, which was, Ford. listen to my customers, I would have built a faster horse. And so for a period of time, I was listening to my customers and just trying to build this faster horse rather than the automobile. And so right. I love that thought that these audiobooks can build up that muscle to give you the discernment between being customer centric and listening to them and also having the adult perspective of what you want for the business. Right. It's true. So, and I was, I, to that very point, again, there's a, a guy who spoke to me a couple of nights ago and he said, uh, he's in a, he's in a peer mentoring group with me. And he mentioned that, uh, Oh, about not niching down. Oh, you should have it for everybody. Yeah, sure. I should be like, uh, unlike Mark Zuckerberg, how he started with his college and then a couple more colleges and then high school. No, you niche down. If, if you're listening to an audio book and Seth Godin says niche down, 
niche down, find your niche and you grow from there. You let those people be your spokespeople, your salespeople. You can't just go out to everybody because you know if you're, if you're there for everybody, you're there for nobody. I love it. And long-term listeners have probably heard me reference uh, Kevin Kelly's essay, A Thousand True Fans, and the premise yeah. that if you have a thousand true fans, you can build an empire from that rather than trying to be all things to all people. And I think that's particularly relevant for our audience because the number one phrase we hear from veterans is, I'm a jack of all trades. I'll go anywhere. I'll do anything. The default is thinking that by being open to everything, it's going to make things simpler. And what you're describing is the exact same principle for businesses, which is you can't be all things to all people. You need to be really specific. Um, you mentioned a peer group. What, what's, what's that? What's the peer group you have? Oh, so the peer group that I'm in, it's, uh, it's called Starbucks. It's over in Portland. It started in 2000. And so they just, it was a gross seven businesses they got together and they kept meeting from time to time to talk through their issues and see who had resources and share resources. And so that's pretty much, it's been around for 19 years now. And I just got into this, to the 2019 cohort. Um, it's been fantastic. Some of the groups in there have been on Shark Tank and, uh, you know, I'm getting some other great connections through there. And um, we actually got a little, uh, um, they, have a, they have a syndicate group uh, for funding. So, we kind of have a group there that they're familiar with us that we can kind of tap um, um, for funding. But of course, we still have to do some due diligence with them and go through some things. But still, they're already familiar with us and aware of us. We're not just a walk in to these guys and gals. I think there's so much value for listeners, regardless of your career path, to have that peer group. Could you share uh, the two things I was curious about is um, if you're open to it, like how often you meet and then also if there's like a fee associated with it? Uh, no fee, actually no fee. And so we meet, we usually do what's called a deep dive. Now, traditionally, the pattern is um, it's once a month we do a deep dive on a company. Now, um, it's suggested I'd be doing about one every other week, about one every two weeks now, because we're trying to get caught up. Because with the new year coming in, there were some adjustments with one of the head guys, he moved. And so things kind of got pushed back and slowed up a bit. So literally we meet like every two weeks and we do what's called a deep dive. Deep dive is where there's a company that we've already, that they've already chosen and put on the calendar. So I had mine about six weeks ago. So we showed up at, uh, you heard of Brazi Bites? The little um, Brazilian, yeah. yeah. So we showed up at their headquarters. Um, we're all sitting in there. So we started with a little, little social. We're drinking, a little eating, chit chatting, and then the head guy. We bring him on. He's down in Bend now. We bring him on via uh, satellite, and we start diving into. Everybody goes around and do like a one minute, two minute update. And then if they need some more assistance later on, we kind of circle back around to them. But then whoever, so it was my deep dive. So I basically give some backdrop on my company and then currently where I'm at now and maybe one or two points, um, super high, high notes or where I may need some assistance. I may need somebody to dig into their Rolodex to contact somebody to, to help me uh, keep the ball moving. That's awesome. What, what advice do you have for veterans who aspire to entrepreneurship? Any, any thoughts on starting a company or continuing down this path? It's, I mean, it's, a, it's like two things in which we've heard, and I'm sure most people have heard, if you're ever around any type of construction, whether it's city or it doesn't matter, it's going to cost you more than you thought to get started and to get going, to get to where you want to be with it. It's going to cost you more and it's going to take you longer than you probably think. You know, that's one of the biggest, that's one of the biggest things. Um, those two things right there, but I wouldn't, um, you know, I mean, we, we all serve, right? So we had the potential to go be shot at. Some of us were shot at. Um, we know we got yelled at in basic training and we had to go through gas chambers and all this other stuff. So, you know, dull out that lizard brain. And if, we, if you went through all this other stuff, when you get out here, if you decide to do this, um, the biggest thing, you can do it because you've done that. So you can do it. It's going to take a little while. But again, that's sped up by you continuing to educate yourself. Um, finding some great mentors and staying around good people, right? And when you, once you feel like there's some leeches in the room sucking you dry of your energy, I'm sorry, but you have to put some distance between yourself and them. And then even two of his family members, they always suggest still maybe not 
not talking to them, but definitely don't talk to them as much and don't tell them about what you're working on and what you're doing because it's none of their business. It's your life. And, and that's why those peer groups are so great. I, I've seen that as well, where it gives you that outlet amidst a safe container of people knowledgeable about that space to talk about that. And then you don't have to share those details with friends or family who might not be as supportive. I think that's, that's right. great. I love your thought on longer cost, longer time. And you're, you know, you're multiple years in between the juice startup and this one to, to entrepreneurship. How do you, how do you fund this? Did, did you build up savings? Do you work on the side? Do you do, do a loan? Like how, what advice do you have for listeners about how to survive while in, uh, taking this infant company into an adult? So, so yeah, it's, it's fantastic that you say that. So, you know, growing up, my dad and my brother both had rental property. So I used to work and cut grass and paint. Do all. And so I knew at some point I wanted to get into rental property. Um, but when I did initially start um, the juice business, um, they let me go, right? They let me go, which is, so I moved from one technical group to a less technical group um, so that I could kind of work on their clock on my business. Other people were watching YouTube videos, so it wasn't like I was, it was a crime, right? And so, and then they were doing a layoff and I had already let it been known like four months before, like, hey, I'm doing layoff, let me go. And ultimately they did. And they told me, hey, you can reapply, we trained you. No, 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 I'm busy, I got some other stuff to do. And so initially I got laid off. And so I was able to run with that. And then when that money starts, so they had a program here in Washington that if you, if you wanna open a business or run a business, so instead of you going out doing, looking for jobs, um, I was able to do some stuff with the Chamber, up in Tacoma, and start to grow my business. So again, so if you do uh, come out, just check for these programs, look for any type of programs in the city um, or in state that you're going to. That was one part of it. And so I had rental property, but at that time, um, I was probably about, I don't know, breaking even on the other two uh, rentals that I had. And so I was able to refinance both of those within a matter of like five or six months. And then I went cash flow positive there and got married and rented out my third house. Um, so brought some more cash in. So between that and a little bit of the disability I was getting from the army, yeah, it made it, it, made it very easy for me to, uh, easier, excuse me, for me to fund kind of what I'm doing. And so it's on that slow learning curve. So I have some funds coming in and that's how I've pretty much been, been running everything. And actually one of my places, I took some equity out of one of them and I paid off what last little bit of the juice debt that I had and set some money aside for a vacation for the family. So um, having that prior thinking and experience being around my, my dad and my brother and having rental property and knowing that it was something I wanted to do, um, that has been the bigger piece to help fund this other thing. That's, that's wonderful. And I hope listeners appreciate an Aaron's story. You heard about him anticipating his departure from the army. He had interviews lined up weeks before he left. He had these rental properties going. So don't, don't think that these, this, these entrepreneurial ventures just happen. It, it is a byproduct of planning, discipline, um, being very deliberate. Um, I, Aaron, I know we only have a couple minutes left. So the two things I'd love to end on is first of all, Tell us, um, tell us how we can support you. Tell us, you know, with your business, what's going on, where people can learn more. And I'll, I'll add all this to the show notes. And then second, I'd love to make space for any final words of wisdom, something we didn't cover from this interview, anything else you want to share with listeners. So of course, um, love to see support on the website. So it's, uh, keto butter.com. Yeah. So, and you know, anybody, so the good thing about the keto diet, I don't know if most people know, it started back in 1920 and it was used for uh, people with epilepsy and it was used to help them control seizures and it was very effective. But at some point somebody came along and said, Hey, let's give them some of this some medicine. We got some real medicine, this powder, this, these pills. And so we've gotten off track. And for the most part, a lot of our illnesses that we feel are from the food that we put in our mouth. So um, I would challenge you to, um, on a daily basis, you know, kind of check what you're putting in your mouth. And even if you don't do it every day, maybe challenge yourself five days out of the week. And then you have those two days, the weekend or whenever, when you just kind of go all out on the eating. But try to lean a little bit more towards eating healthy. You're going to feel better and you're going to live a, a healthier life. 
Sorry, I'm muted. Um, I, I love that. I want to give you more space too. I, I, I love what you're saying. I just want to chime in. I know this is a little bit of a soapbox, but I feel like there's a lot that we can control. I think that m many people in the military are used to healthy eating, but I love this. I remember I went to, um, uh, when I first met my wife, I was pretty, pretty overweight and unhealthy. And I went to the doctor, I had like high cholesterol. And he's like, well, you can either start eating healthy and start exercising, or you can take this pill. And I'm like, don't, don't give me that simple option. Like the right answer for me, at least, is I need to get my, I need to be more intentional about what I put in my body and how I'm using it. And so what I love about, um, I just want to point out for listeners, I love that you have very clear values and you seem to have started a company that's in, in alignment with those values. And I think that that's very powerful for you to be doing something that you believe in for both, you know, personally and professionally. No, but thank you. Thank you. And I would say the second part that I didn't kind of mention earlier within the whole like pre-thought of, of how you're going to live your life and what you're doing. So the realm of property, like I said, has been fantastic. But I would also say this. I had been saving money. I think, I don't know, I only had like, I think 16000 saved cash in my bank account at the time. And uh, all of my credit cards were, were, were clear sitting in my safe because I felt like, and, you know, like I said, I already had a couple of rental properties, so I didn't know if I was going to find something else um, as far as real estate wise, something bigger to invest in or what the case would be. But I wanted to be ready. Right. And so all my again, all my credit, I had no credit card debt. I had some savings. Oh, and I had some money in a 401k that I was still currently paying into. And at some point I did cash that out. So it's kind of like uh, Les Brown says it's better. I think Brian Tracy said it as well. It's better to be prepared for an opportunity and not have one and to have an opportunity and not be prepared because you just, you don't know what's coming. And just like in the military, that is the very purpose of all the training. You train, so if you do have to go fight, you can win, right? You're not sitting around all day, right? So. I love that. I hadn't heard that quote before, but I think it's, it's uh, you know, that came through with Yolanda Clark who made the connection. Like I got the sense that she was constantly honing her business pitch and you know, over years she was getting it yeah. ready and then when the timing was right she pounced on it but it that was only because she had been preparing herself she'd been preparing her finances her business plan all of these things and i love that thought that you know when opportunity appears you can take it and if it doesn't it, you're still prepared i think that's that's really wonderful always prepared um, well, Aaron, thank you for your time today. I will have links in the show notes for everything we discussed, a link to ketobutter.com, as well as the 10% off coupon, which is Bunker Vet, which you can apply at checkout. Thank you so much, Aaron. Hey, thanks, Justin. Hey, and shoot me your uh, address, please. Oh, awesome, awesome. Service, service, service. Thank you so much for listening. I hope you enjoyed this episode. Quick couple admin points. Um, we release brand new episodes every single Monday and Thursday. Those are usually recorded uh, about a month or so before they go live. Um, and um, every Monday and Thursday, we have an interview, usually almost always with a military veteran about their civilian career. More and more, we're starting to add in experts who may not be met veterans, but may have some expertise that will help the military veteran community. Um, Saturdays, I typically post more of a behind the scenes episode, which is a free form format. I try to use what I'm calling a mullet format. And by that, I mean business up front, party in the back, uh, talking through admin points, uh, professional topics related to the podcast. It might be a conversation I had that week. It might have been an interview I had that week, but just trying to, to share things that are top of mind that may help you in more of a free form, straight from the heart format. And then the party in the back is the personal side of things, just kind of more free flowing uh, thoughts on life, on um, uh, improving oneself, just kind of whatever's going on in life and trying to be authentic and um, honest about um, those things as well. Special thanks. We have an all volunteer army of people behind Beyond the Uniform making this possible. Uh, we do this on our lunch breaks, on our evenings, on our weekends, because we love the military community. We want to give back. We want to make a difference. We want that as part of the purpose in our life that we we valued in the military. Um, so special thanks to Steve Bain. Steve does pretty much everything. He helps uh, secure guests. He does our newsletter. He keeps the reels rolling and keeps me sane. Kathleen Dillon, the 
first person to join our team. She writes text transcripts of every single episode. It's wild. She keeps up with two of these a week despite a demanding career and education right now. Uh, but those transcripts help us get more SEO value, helps her audience more. Um, Andrew Woolridge is our data guru. He helps us understand the numbers, which is the easiest way for us to figure out how we can better support you and um, adds kind of the, the data oversight for that. Rick Healy does all of our social media. He is gaining more and more of an audience for us by getting our videos, getting our podcasts out on social channels. Um, the best way to stay in contact with us is if you go to beyondtheinformed.org, there is a newsletter. You'll have a little pop-up that comes up. You can put your email in. We email twice per month. We try to be respectful, but it is a great way to get uh, appraised of upcoming events, upcoming interviews, promos where companies are giving discounts to Beyond the Uniform listeners, and more. Uh, this does cost money to put on. We are um, uh, committed to not charging veterans directly, um, and the way that we kind of offset costs is through corporate sponsors. So if you know of a company that would like to get in front of a military audience and their families, uh, that's one way that we can both add value to our members, but also offset the costs of Beyond the Uniform and give us a little bit of budget to start expanding what we're doing. So that's the, the best way you can help us. If that's not something that you can do, a positive review on iTunes is greatly appreciated. Have a wonderful week. We will be back Monday, Thursday, and Saturday with more interviews. And uh, yeah, keep up the, the, the listening. Take care.